All right, good morning, community. And I also want to say a special welcome to those of you who joined us digitally on this one-year anniversary. That's exciting stuff there. I'll tell you what, here's what we'll do. Um, you lean in, all right? Give me a commitment. You're going to kind of lean in for the next 25 minutes. And I'll tell you what, I'll make a commitment that this will add value to your life. I think this is one of those things that could be a really important kind of memory-making, going like, hold it. That was when some things shifted for me, okay? Um, I have two sons, two sons that are both competitive runners. And in the last year, my daughter um, really kind of got into it. I mean, she ran her first 10K, she ran her first 15K, she ran a half marathon, she did a triathlon, and uh, yeah, and so like um, around the first of the year, she comes to me and says, hey dad, I think I want to run the Chicago Marathon. And I'm like, that's awesome, right? I mean, it's a big goal, it'll be a big accomplishment, it'll increase your confidence, running's good for you, that is terrific. And then she says to me, and uh, would you run it with me? I mean, what do you say I mean, when your daughter asks you to do that? <laughs> Something like, <laughs> no, you say no, don't be stupid. <laughs> I didn't know that was an option. I wish I would have talked sooner. Uh, so, I'm, so yeah, I'm in, and uh, we started training, you know, in, in, the, in the early spring, and then la it was last week was 18 miler, next week's a 20 miler, and you know what? Those, those long runs, <laughs> they're long. And when you're not fast, it's even longer and hard. And I, I mean, like, I got this thing going on in my foot here, and I got this, this thing happening with my heel here. But I'll tell you what, I think I, I, think I got to figure it out. I think I, I figured out something's going to change everything. Have you heard about these? Look at these shoes here. Look at these. You heard of Hoka's? You heard of these? Look at, the, look at that bad boy. Look at that cushion on that shoe there, that heel. Is that awesome? I, I think maybe that's what I need. Listen, here, there's how they describe these shoes, these running shoes. These shoes feature a lightweight exceptionally plush meta rocker. I don't even know what it is, but I need that. For effortlessly smooth transition. And look, when you run in, in, in Hoka's, look at this guy. His feet don't even touch the ground. <laughs> right? That's, that'll change everything. Now, don't tell me you haven't fallen for this kind of stuff. Right? Right? I mean, how many of you here are willing to admit that you have a Snuggie? You have a Snuggie? Anybody got a Snuggie? You've seen those on infomercials? We got some Snuggies. That, you know what Snuggies, they promise they will do away with your winter blues. So, so ladies, if you're ever depressed, feel a little anxious, anxiety, you don't, don't need any coaching, don't need help, don't need any counseling. You just need a Snuggie. It'll do away with every winter blue. Um, how about anybody bought blue blockers? Any blue blocker owners that are willing to admit it? Because, I mean, come on, these things, there we go. There we go, right here in the front. You are so smart. Because you know what these things can do? Listen to what they can do here. Blue blockers. With blue blockers, the world will change. It says on the internet, it must be true. Will change, and you'll never want to go back to ordinary sunglasses. Why, why, do we, why, do, why do we fall for these things? I think it's because we're all looking for something that'll change everything. And I don't think it's just in infomercials either. I think all of us, at different times in our lives, things well up inside of us, and we'll say, you know what, man, if I, if I just had the right job, that would change everything. If I, if I just had the right guy, if I just met the right girl, if, if I could just achieve this, if I could just accomplish that, if I just had that, it would change everything. And even when we get it, and then we find out it doesn't change everything, the search continues. It continues. And that's why I think writer Henry David Thoreau described it this way, and he said this. He said, the mass of men and women, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. There's so many of us that we lead lives of quiet desperation. I've, I've spent a lot of years kind of thinking about, reflecting even my own kind of desperation in certain areas, and, in, and your own, even I have the opportunity to write on this stuff. And I can tell you that, for the most part, I think this desperation kind of wells up in, in three different areas. See if this doesn't resonate with you. I think all of us are desperate for love. We want to love and be loved. We get dumped, right, or even divorced, and what do we do? We dust ourselves off, and we get back out there again, don't we? I, I was talking to a friend of mine whose mom is well in her 80s, just recently, I mean, the last few weeks, widowed, and another guy now, who's in his 80s, seemed to be kind of hanging around, expressed some interest, and she was already so excited. 
What is it inside of us? We are desperate for love or purpose, purpose. This one's really real for me. I want to know I've made a difference. I want to know that somewhere along the way my life made a mark, that, that somehow it counted for something. And I don't think you're that much different than me. We're desperate for purpose. And I'd also say meaning. That, that when, when, when things, hurtful things that happened, maybe from our past, that were undeserved, or even maybe bigger tragedies happen in life, we can't help but kind of just kind of even go, why? We want some of the answers, Why? Why do these kind of things happen? We, we look for meaning. And here's what happens next. Well-meaning Christians and churches, they come along and they'll say, well, here's what you need. What you need is you need God in your life. You need a relationship with God. Or they'll get very specific. You need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what you need. And I've said that. And let me also be very, very clear before you go, like, where is he going with this? I 100% believe that, okay? I 100% believe that. But now, here's what I want to, I would also want to keep it real in this room. Why is it then that some people who have believed in God, who have had expressed faith, who said yes to God, still find themselves with that quiet desperation? Why is the people that come to church, maybe even come to church regularly, they still kind of find themselves in their lives kind of singing that old U2 song, you know, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Why is it some folks, even, even after maybe an experience like even getting baptized, they have this big high, but then all of a sudden you find yourself in a valley and you feel that quiet desperation. Why? Come on, you, you right? And maybe some of you are here for the first time, or maybe the first time in a long time. And here's what's happened. You've seen some of your friends, you could call it what you want, we'll call it try religion, and it works. But you've seen some of the others who try it, and then it doesn't work. And so maybe you're here, and yes, you're curious and you're interested, but at the same time, you're also cynical and skeptical. You've got both those things kind of happen at once. And you wonder, what's the deal? Why is it that faith, God, church, Sometimes it does deliver on the, the promise of love and purpose and meaning. But the other times it does, it doesn't deliver on the promise of love, purpose, and meaning. Why? Here's where I want to go. We're going to go in this series. I want to offer you what I think could be a really, what I'd call a paradigm-shifting thought about faith and spirituality. This is kind of a radical, swipe, kind of slight twist that I think could really help you in a profound way. It's been very, very helpful to me. Because I think perhaps what's going on is we've settled for a version of Christianity that God never offered us. That maybe we bought into a form of Christianity that was really man-made and not God-designed. And that we really misunderstood what Jesus offered us. Let me explain, I think, what many of us have bought into. I think many of us have bought into what I'm going to call in-and-out Christianity. Okay? In-and-out Christianity. Maybe you've been to Southern California, you had in-and-out burgers. Yeah? Yeah, we like those, right? Okay. Those are, that's good stuff. In-N-Out Christianity is not like In-N-Out Burgers. In-N-Out Burgers are good. This, this, I'm going to say this is not so good. All right? Just wanted to clarify that. In-N-Out Christianity, what are we talking about here? This version of Christianity, I, I think, will actually leave you kind of longing for something more, looking for something different. It will actually, if you buy into this wholeheartedly, it is a thin slice of what Jesus ever talked about. It will leave you kind of with this quiet desperation. Now, I think this diagram here is... is what sociologists would call, they call this a, 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 a bounded set. A bounded set. Because in a bounded set, it's very clear what objects are in and what objects are out. What's in and what's out. So for example, let's just illustrate it by talking about like triangles. Um, if you want to have something that was a bounded set of triangles, you would say, okay, to be, a tri to be in, you have to be the shape that has three distinct sides and has three distinct angles. And if you have that, then you are in. If you don't have that, then you're out. So in this example, a circle is out and a triangle is, help me out, it's what? A triangle's in. A square is out, but a triangle is in. In the bounded set kind of thinking, you're really clear about what gets in and what gets out, and that's the most important thing. So if we begin to apply that then to our faith, okay, in and out Christianity, some of the most important things there is we have to clearly define, and what's most important to define is who's in and who's out. And I'm not saying that's not important, but I'm saying with this kind of thinking, it's like the, almost the only thing that's important. And so what you do is you define what's in and what's out. And you might say, oh, okay, 
Well, the way for you to get in across this boundary is you have to, on a survey, check the box that says Christian as a preferred religion. You check the box Christian, then you are in and you get to go to heaven. Or maybe you're at an event somewhere and someone says, if you pray this prayer, then you get in. And so because you're going, I want to be in, you pray the prayer, you pray the prayer, you get in. If you don't pray the prayer, you're out. Or um, maybe, maybe even you profess your faith, maybe you can get baptized, because baptism is the way to know for sure that you're in. So you get in, anybody who doesn't is out, and that becomes the most important thing. In in and out and kind of thinking, in and out Christianity, the most important thing is getting clear about the boundaries and who's in and who's out. Now, when it comes to personally, what you want to do then is I want to make sure I'm in, right? Right? I don't want to be left out. So I want to do whatever the thing is, whatever that thing is across the line to get in. And then after that, I want to make sure all the people that I love and my family, friends, neighbors, coworkers that are out, that they find out how to get in so then they can get in. And the overall mission then of the church becomes simply this, getting everyone who's out there in here. Now that sounds like it makes sense so far, right? But here's where the problem is. And stick with me on this. Here's the problem. The problem is this. That when you have only in and out Christianity, once you're in, once you're in, any further progress after getting in is just optional. It's just optional. Any further growth after that is just optional. Anything after that is just optional. It's not necessary because you're already in. And I want to suggest, could it be, could it be by focusing only on crossing the line and saying, hey, I want my passport so I can wait in the, the gate there till the, the plane to heaven shows up. Maybe focusing only on that is part of the problem. Could it be that maybe we're missing the big idea that Jesus was offering us? Because what happens for some of us is when we focus only on in and out Christianity, once we get in, once I was baptized, once I prayed the prayer, once I went through confirmation class or whatever the thing was for you that said you're in, okay? And maybe that would now was 10 years ago and you're just kind of sitting there in All of a sudden, what wells up inside of you is you start to feel this unfulfilled sense of quiet desperation. You're going, hold it, this shouldn't be happening because I'm in. I'm in. Why is this happening to me? And I think upon closer examination of this in and out version of Christianity, this is not the good news or not the totality of the good news that Jesus preached. He didn't just say, jump through a few hoops, then I'll get you to heaven someday. In fact, check this out. Jesus said heaven can start right now. He said heaven can start eternal life. The way he described it, he says, starts right now. Look what, these are straight from Jesus, straight from his words right here, Mark 1, 15. Jesus says, hey, the time's come. He's talking about his own coming to earth. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. It's right here. Repent and believe the good news. Now, when Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God has come near, what he's doing, he's telling us there is a way of life that is right here available to you right now that's called eternal life. It's the quality of heaven on earth, not this quiet desperation. Um, John Ortberg wrote a book, and I'd I'd recommend you check this out. It's called Eternity is Now in Session, all right? It's good stuff, orthodox stuff, solid biblical stuff, and here's how he explained it. Jesus' good news, his gospel is simply this. The kingdom of God has now, through Jesus, become available for ordinary human beings to live in. It's here, period, now, period. You can live in it if you want to. That's what he says. And what does he mean by the kingdom of God is available now? Since Jesus came. Okay, stick with me on this. Everybody has a kingdom. Okay, everybody has a kingdom. Um, And your kingdom is the place where what you say goes. Where what you say goes. Now, your kingdom primarily is just kind of your life, where you say, whatever you say kind of goes. Now, in my kingdom, um, lately, because I've been running so much, I get to have dessert every day. (laughs) All right? Don't judge me, okay? My wife in her kingdom, she likes to have kale. There is no kale allowed in my kingdom, okay? (laughs) Now, having a kingdom 
is not a bad thing. Having a kingdom is actually a good thing. Having a kingdom is part of what it means to be made in the image of God. So we have a kingdom, and that's a gift that God's given to us. But God also has a kingdom, okay, the kingdom of God. And in his kingdom, things go the way God wants them to go. And in God's kingdom, he begins to offer us more of the things that we long for, love and purpose and meaning. That's the kingdom of heaven. Now, on earth, okay, on our individual kingdoms, let's think about our own individual kingdoms, our own lives, our kingdoms begin to intersect. And when our kingdoms intersect, all of a sudden you have a family. Or maybe if they, a whole bunch of them intersect, you might have a, a, a neighborhood, or you might have a, a business, or a community, or even a country, or a political system. That's the intersection of all of our different kingdoms. That's not so much the kingdom of heaven, that's the kingdom of earth. And in the kingdom of earth, well, you know what? It hasn't gone too well, in case you haven't noticed. Because the kingdoms we're in charge of, there's violence, there's poverty, there's corruption, there's oppression. We, we've created a whole collection of broken and corrupt kingdoms. So God sees this, and when he, he just can't, can't take it anymore out of love, he shows up in the person of Jesus, and here's what he says. Here I am, I've come. The kingdom of God is here right now. Jesus is saying, turn your life around, repent and believe, because this is good news for every one of you that feel that quiet desperation. Basically, Jesus came and he says, listen, this is going to change everything. Me being here can change everything. And the good news was this, that there is now a different, better way of living in this world. A way that can give you joy, a way that can give you peace, a way that can give you freedom, and also the things you long for, love, purpose, meaning. And what he says is here now, you don't have to wait until you die and go to heaven. And here's, here's, here's what I'm realizing, maybe you can tell, this is why I'm so excited about what we're going to talk about during this series, is Jesus didn't just offer us kind of a, a, a ticket, a first class ticket to heaven. He offers us so much more. In fact, Jesus came to bring up there, down here. His message wasn't just about getting us into heaven, but getting some heaven into us. And he came to offer us an eternal life that actually starts right now and then goes on through eternity. So how do we find it? He says, here's how you find it, okay? I'm the way. You follow me, I'll show you the way there. I'm the truth. I will tell you the truth about how to have this kind of life that you long for. I am the life. You model your life after me. You get so close to me that you begin to model your life after mine. And I'll tell you what, you will experience that life. You'll experience that life. All right, so let me explain this now. Let's, let's back up the truck a little bit. This in and out version of Christianity. What, the reason we buy into it is because there is a part of it that's true. But overall, this is not the good news. Okay, this is not the good news that Jesus offers us. Instead, Christianity is more like what sociologists, instead of a bounded set, is actually what you call a centered set. And a center set is defined by what is at the center. What's at the center? And at the center of this set, right here, represented by this cross, is Jesus. Think about this. At the center is Jesus. And what matters most is not merely crossing a line at some point in time, as important as that might be, and whether you're in or out, as important as that be, what, what really matters is are you moving toward or away from? Are you moving towards Jesus or away from Jesus? That's what actually matters most. And the life that Jesus offers us is the eternal kind of life where he's at the center. And here's what happens. Look at that. And if we want to experience life, we are all, okay, by the Holy Spirit, we gravitationally pulled towards him so we can know the way we can know his truth and begin to imitate his life. That's what he's offering us here. Now, here's the problem. And maybe you're ahead of me on this one, okay? Here's the problem. C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. All right? He, he just, he nails it on this one. Look, look what he says. He says, well, here's the problem, though. The world does not consist of what, of 100%, and I would say Christian, hundreds of people who are 100% Christian and 100% non-Christian. There are people, and a great many of them, who are slowly ceasing to be Christian, but still call themselves by that name. And then he puts in, and some of them are clergymen. He takes a nice little shot at me. Thank you very much, C.S. Lewis. 
Then he adds, though, there are other people who are slowly becoming Christian, though they do not yet call themselves so. Okay, what, 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 how do you explain that? I think this diagram explains it. Here's the deal. Jesus is at the center. This is where life is. The kind of life, I'm telling you, the kind of life that all of us long for. The kind of life that God wants us to all to have. And, but what happens is we're either headed this way or we're headed this way. And sometimes some of us who've been closest to Jesus find ourselves in a season where actually we're headed away from him. And some of us, maybe you're here for the very first time, and guess what? You may appear to be the one who's farthest from Jesus, but you know what? you're starting to experience life because you're, you're getting closer to him. Here's my personal experience, okay? Let's say I'm the lead pastor, which I am. So you're going, oh, you guys can, oh, well, so Dave must be close to Jesus. But here's the deal. Even though it appears I'm close to Jesus by all the hoops I've jumped through, right? If my life is like this arrow headed this way, instead of being heaven on earth, it becomes more and more of a living hell. Everything in my kingdom, my life, my marriage, my family, I'm telling you this, my work, everything, the further I drift from Jesus, the less I have the things that I really want from life. Right, give me a little nod. If you, are you with me on this? This is so important that we get this. But guess what? People could be way out here, and they'll show up at church for the first time, they're like, man, my life is changing. This is the most awesome thing. Why is that? Why is it someone way out here is experiencing that, and mine's starting to feel, they're starting to feel more and more like heaven, and mine's starting to feel more and more like hell. Why is that? Because they're getting closer to Jesus, right? It's all about who's at the center. Let me illustrate. Maybe this will help you a little bit. Um, like I mentioned, so my daughter's got me doing this marathon, right, which I'm looking forward to. And one of the benefits of it, or I'm probably in better shape than I've been in the last few years. Now, I started taking this series serious like sometime like in January. I joined the Fort Hill Fitness Center. And at the Fort Hill Fitness Center there, um, it was too cold to run outside. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll go there and I'll lift a little bit and I'll use the, uh, the treadmill and I'll use their running track. Now, that was a big help in my own physical conditioning. Now, I could tell the story with bounded set thinking. And bounded set thinking, I would tell it this way. Ever since I joined the Fort Hill Fitness Center, I have been in just better shape. I'm in better condition. I could say, you know what, every time it's like I walk into that Fort Hill Fitness and into that building, it's like it, it, it has changed me. And that would be partly true, right? But the real truth is actually, okay, let's go to the next slide. Actually, it was proximity to the weight room it was actually getting close to the treadmill, actually going and running on the track every day. That is the thing that changed me. Are you with me on this? Because see, what happens is sometimes in the way we verse, in the way we talk about our own spirituality, we'll say, you know what? Man, ever since I started coming to that church, even if it's community, man, it's like my life's never been the same. And that's partly true. But is it really a big yellow box that changed you? I mean, I love the yellow box. Come on, people, help me. Is it really? No, I mean, we could sell this thing and it become, you know, some people think it isn't a church when they drive by. No, that wasn't what really changed. What really changed you is you took a big step, okay, towards Jesus. That's what's changing you. Right? And so for some of us too, even, and you're going to get a chance to see a baptism this morning. And I'm telling you, baptism is a really important marker event. Yeah, it's a big step he tells every one of us to take when we're ready to make a commitment to Jesus. I would love to have all of you do it. But some of us say, you know what, hey, when I got baptized... That, that's the thing. Boy, my life was changed forever. Is that true? Yes, it's true, but it's not the whole truth. It wasn't just taking that simple line across the boundary there, but what happened is you took a big step towards Jesus. And when you move towards Jesus, okay, that's what changes you. And so what I'm suggesting, okay, is that we really focus on this. What if we said instead, I want to see us all become apprentices of Jesus, and an apprenticeship is daily learning from the master, focused on Jesus, not the boundaries. Here, here's what an apprenticeship is. An apprentice of Jesus is someone whose ultimate goal is to live their life the way Jesus would live if he were me. And what we do in order to do that, we get, try to get close to him every day, as close as we possibly can. And I'll tell you what, if we would take this seriously, saying, you know what? I want to have an apprenticeship with Jesus, getting closer to him every day, not just step over a hoop. There is nothing, there is nothing, there is no problem in human life 
that an apprenticeship with Jesus cannot solve. You, you name the problem, small or big, little kingdom, your little kingdom, or, or the global kind of kingdoms of this earth, greed, fear, racism. Can Jesus solve those problems? Help me out. Yes. Yeah. Injustice, divorce, sexual assault, neglect, pollution, suffering. Can Jesus solve those problems? Yes. Addiction, rejection, bitterness, violence. Can Jesus solve those problems? Yes. How about the big things like, like war or death? I'm telling you, if, if you would follow him and get close to him, and I decided to get close to him, and we all decided to get close to him, there is no thing that Jesus can't solve. And guess what? That changes everything. Amen? Amen. That's what we're talking about. Let's go to the next one. Let me give you three things. And I want these to stick in your head so you're going to go, okay, let me make sense of what you're saying here. Here's number one. Crossing the spiritual boundary line can be an important step, but please understand, it's only one step, and it might be, it might be saying a prayer, it might be coming to church, it might be that you went through confirmation class, but it's only one step in a journey of co- trying to constantly get closer to Jesus. So what we then learn is Jesus actually came from heaven to earth, and he came to change everything. He came to change everything right now. Therefore, an apprenticeship, us saying, I want to learn from the master, I want to get close to him, close to Jesus, it can change everything in your life. And it's available to us. So let me leave you with two challenges, all right? Challenge number one. Join us next Sunday, all right? Be here next Sunday. Now, are you going to come to church next Sunday so it can change your life? No, okay? I'm going to do this whole talk all over again. I know, we're all programmed. We kind of think that way, don't we? Oh, hold on, pastor said come to church and change your life. Well, I hope it does, but it's not church kind of, because you, you know what? Like, I could, go to, I could go to the Fort Hills, and sometimes I do this. I go to the Fort Hill uh, Fitness Center, and I don't have time to run or anything, so I'll go in there and I'll do email, and then I'll just leave. <laughs> That's not changing my life, right? And you guys could come in here, right? And you could be texting friends and doing Twitter and planning your menus for the rest of the week. All that stuff, that's not gonna change. It's not being in here. Come in here and take it, because that helps you take a next step towards Jesus. That's what changes our life. We gotta get that part. It's not just crossing the boundary. So yes, please join us next Sunday. And here's why it could change your life. Because we're gonna take you on a journey, okay? We're gonna take you on a journey and show you how to every day apprentice with Jesus. How to do that, that's the life change. That's what happens. And here's the second thing. We have a This Changes Everything journal. Our, our team's put together a journal, and um, you can get those at the Welcome Center. It's just out the doors to your left. I would love to have every one of you pick one of those up. It's a journal through this five-week series, and what it does is it has some scriptures in there, some quotes from spiritual writers, and a couple of questions. And we really want you to use it as a guide, okay, a guide for you on this journey to help you take one step after another, getting closer and closer to Jesus. Because I'm telling you, the life that we're all after, I am, I am so convinced of this. That's the life that Jesus is offering us. And it's not a late night infomercial that makes empty promises like blue blockers and Snuggies, okay? This thing is real. This thing is available. And the stuff that we're longing for, he's offering to us. And he's saying, hey, heaven, eternal life can start right now. And that changes everything. That changes everything. All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that uh, when you looked down and you saw how we were running our own kingdoms, the kingdoms of our lives and our marriages and our families and our business and our neighborhoods, that you had mercy on us, that you had just unconditional love for us, so much so that you left heaven to come to earth to offer us eternal life, to bring heaven to earth, and that can change everything in our kingdoms. Lord, help us understand this is not something we just kind of wait for someday, but it can start and begin right now. Right now. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.